Good evening, my friends. It's Sabbath in Battle Creek right now. The evening has come, and we only have two more meetings left. We're coming to you live from Battle Creek with another edition of the 11th Hour Evidence, and we are excited about the message Pastor Ashrick has for us tonight. I'm your host, Pastor Jason Sieber, and I want to encourage you to pull up your chair and get ready because Pastor Ashrick is passionate. Isn't he always passionate? He's passionate about what he's going to be sharing with us tonight about prophecy. But that's the ultimate cheat below, wasn't it? <laughs> but I have to tell you that Eric really has a powerful message in that song that we should all be listening to tonight. It's time for us to come home. It's time for us to make our decisions for Jesus Christ. This series is just about over, and we want desperately for people to be making decisions to come home. That's what it's all about. A man lay on his bed in Washington, D.C. The death shadows were gathering around him. His friends were gathering around him. It was a muggy, hot day in July. And as he expired, he raised his voice once more and said, Jefferson lives. You see, the man was none other than John Adams. And the day, July 4, 1824. Exactly 50 years to the day that he had set his pen to the paper of the Declaration of Independence. What he didn't know was just across town, Jefferson had passed away about three hours before. Both of the men who had formulated the great heart of our great republic passed away on the same day within hours of each other, the 50th anniversary of the signing of, Declaration of, the, of the Declaration of Independence. And the nation took this as a evidence that God had a special plan for the United States. Could you see how they do that? Amazing, amazing event. Little did they know, though, that a much greater evidence was to be found in no other place than the Bible itself. Did you know? that the Bible tells about amazing destiny with respect to this country. If you didn't, you'll find out just about now. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Wasn't that a beautiful song? Yeah. Very nice. That was extremely low, Jason. <laughs> but the Lord will forgive you, and I'm sure Eric will forgive you. Where's Eric at? Is he forgiven? I'm, I, he's forgiven. You're getting the nod there. Isn't that powerful? Did you hear that introduction? I freely confess that I did not know that. I feel like I have learned more about history. This is a true story. I feel like I have learned more about history in the last two weeks staying with Pastor Sieber than in the first 20 or I guess 31 years of my life. The fella is an encyclopedia when it comes to history. Names and dates and places and battles and it is staggering. And I just find it remarkable that the two men, or two of the men, who were most responsible for bringing this Declaration of Independence together and, and giving birth to this burgeoning young nation, uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, that both of them died on the 50th anniversary, July 4th, the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence within hours of one another. Now, does that strike you as amazing, yes or no? Amen. It's remarkable, and I appreciate what you said there, Jason, that, that the country took that as a sign, as a providential sign that God had endorsed and would continue to endorse this nation. And I appreciate you using that as an introduction because it sets the stage perfectly for our message tonight entitled, The United States in Bible Prophecy. The United States in Bible Prophecy. And so you can see how nicely that will segue into our message proper this evening. Now before we get into that message, what will we do first? Pray. pray. That's right. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have been with us hitherto this evening. Father, you have spoken to us through the song and certainly through this powerful introductory story that Jason has communicated for us. Father, we pray now that you will come into this room, that you will condescend to be here, to speak not, Father, because of me, but in spite of me. Father, may my lips be loosed like Isaiah of old. May you touch my lips with a coal from the altar, that the words that I say and the thoughts that I think would come flowing not from a man, but from the very throne of God. Father, please be with us tonight. And as we explore this provocative yet powerful topic, 
We pray that you will illumine our minds and that we may walk in the light. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Everyone can say, Amen. Amen. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 13. Our message is entitled, The United States in Bible Prophecy. And we're going to do something very much like what we did uh, several days ago when we read Revelation chapter 12 through in its entirety. You might recall that. We just began the program by, by getting a, an airplane view of the book of Revelation, chapter 12 particularly, just reading it through straight. And we're going to do the same thing tonight as we commence. Except this time, instead of reading Revelation chapter 12, we're going to read Revelation chapter 13 the entire way through. Now let me tell you why we're doing that. The goal that I want you to, the goal that I want to attain here, and what I want you to see, is that in a panorama, as we sort of fly over this chapter with an airplane view, we are going to see the great movements and these two great figures. There are two beasts in this chapter. How many beasts in this chapter? The first rises from the sea, that's the sea beast. The second rises from the earth, and that's the earth beast. And as we read the chapter, what I want you to be paying very careful attention to is the relationship between the two beasts. What, what does the first beast do for the second and the second for the first? What is the mutuality, reciprocity, and relationship here? That's what I want you to be thinking about as we read it through in its entirety. Let's begin in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. Here's the picture you have in your mind. John there, 24 miles out into the Aegean Sea, riding with an aged hand on a piece of papyrus or leather, and he is thinking back to the fact that all of his friends, all of his comrades and compatriots are gone. Only he remains alive of the original disciples, and Jesus has appeared to him to give him this incredible vision, this panorama of future events. As John sits down to write what God had shown him, put yourself there on that rocky, barren island of Patmos and see with me what John saw in prophetic vision. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. Then I stood upon the sand of the sea. John was surrounded by sea. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe and tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast, beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, his number is 666. Six, six. Powerful chapter, isn't it? As we read it in its totality, you really get a sense for the interrelationship between these two beasts. Were you picking up on that, yes or no? Let, let me try and unpack it for you as we commence with our message tonight. The first beast is the sea beast. He rises up out of the sea. He reigns for a protracted period of time, 1,260 prophetic days or literal years. He then receives a deadly wound. What kind of a wound, everyone? A deadly wound. But what happens to that wound? 
The Bible says his deadly wound was healed. Now, a remarkable thing happens after that. John then sees a second beast rising up, and this second beast's primary task is to act as an apologist or a spokesperson or a prophet for the first beast. Did you notice that, yes or no? The primary task of this second beast is to direct attention like an arrow back to the first beast. It says he causes the earth to worship not himself, but who, everyone? The first beast. So the second beast functions in a very similar way to the way that prophets in the Old Testament functioned for God. Let me repeat that. The second beast functions for the first beast in the very same kind of way that prophets in the Old Testament spoke and ministered for God. Just as God would raise them up to speak His words and to point individuals, particularly the nation of Israel, to Him, so too this beast rises up, speaks His words, commits His acts to point and direct people to the first beast. He is the prophet of the first beast. In fact, he's referred to in the book of Revelation as the false prophet. Now, did you see that interrelationship, yes or no? That is the whole purpose of the second beast is to point people back, the whole world in deception, back to the first beast that we identified last night as the Roman church state. Now, before going any further, let's do a little bit of review and sort of summarize what we learned last night. John sees this amalgam beast. He sees it coming up out of the sea. Remember, seas in the Bible represent peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages in a prophetic context. In what kind of a context did I say? Now, that doesn't mean that any old time you see water in the Bible that it means peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages, but in prophecy, in what word did I say? end time prophecy, then you can make that application safely. Amen? Yes or no? This is not licensed to read into, into any time that water occurs in the Bible as peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. No, no, no. John sees this horrific beast rising up out of the sea, out of a populous area. We've already learned that a Bible, or pardon me, a beast in the Bible represents what? Uh, what does it represent? A king or a kingdom, a nation. You've got it. So here comes this nation, this kingdom rising up out of a populated area of the earth. When John saw him, he described him as possessing the, the characteristics of those beasts from Daniel chapter 7. And let us note that here. We discussed that last evening in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel saw four beasts. How many beasts, everyone? The first was like a lion. The second was a bear. The third was a leopard. And the fourth was a... We don't know what it was, right? Now, remember, those beasts represented the great kingdoms. The great what? What did the first beast represent? Babylon, Babylon then? Medo-Persia, then? Greece. Then? Rome. Rome. That's exactly right. And so when John was looking backward, he saw them in the exact opposite order that Daniel had seen them when he was looking prophetically into the future. Daniel had seen lion, bear, leopard, ferocious beast. Yet John, when looking back through time, living during the time of Rome, saw the ferocious beast characteristic, and then he saw leopard, bear, and lion. Daniel looking forward into prophecy, John looking back into history. Are we on the same page, yes or no? Yeah. Now, when John here describes this beast as having all of these strange characteristics, what he is saying is, is that this is a beast that is made up of all the beasts of Daniel 7, directing our minds back to Daniel in the seventh chapter. We learned last night that one of the characteristics of this Antichrist beast would be that he would reign for 1,260 prophetic days or literal years. How many years did I say? 1,260 or 42 months. That's right. Now, I told you last night how many times that time period occurs in the Bible. How many remember? How many times does this time period occur? Seven. Five times in Revelation and two in Daniel. So it is a very significant time period. This beast reigned from 538 A.D. 538 A.D. for 1,260 prophetic days or literal years until 1798. Exactly 1,260 years. Now, remarkably, as that period of time came to a close, a French general by the name of, I said, Berthier, and last night Jason said, it's Berthier. So I, I apologize for saying it wrong. A French general by the name of Berthier, he probably knows everything else about him, too. In 1798, marched into the Vatican City, he took the Pope off of his throne, and he declared everything in the Vatican to be the public property of France. Of what nation did I say? France. France. And people that were watching the papacy at that time declared that the beast had received a deadly wound. And what, what happens to you if you receive a deadly wound? You tell me. You die. You die. 
And so people were saying, this is the end of the papacy. I mean, the Pope has been taken off of his throne and everything's been declared the public property. I mean, it will never rise again. It had reigned exactly as God had said from 538 coming to power there in the 6th century for 1,260 years and coming to its apparent end in 1798. Now, we discussed that last night. We've just given you a little more detail now. Now, note with me that this beast reigns just as the little horn in Daniel 7 for that protracted period of time that we just described. Yet something very interesting happens. John then sees a second beast. Go with me now to Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 1 and extending down to verse 10, John is describing the first beast. The what beast did I say, everyone? The first beast. The what beast, everyone? first beast. We've got to be on the same page here. We will not be able to make any kind of progress, any kind of meaningful progress. So John is seeing almost in cinematic vision. Pretend with me that it's, it's the equivalent of being on a movie screen. And John is seeing this first beast. Think of some of the things that that first beast did. He made war with the saints. He reigned for this protracted period of time. He was a blasphemous beast. He changed the times and laws of God. And John is watching all of this in cinematic vision. Are you with me? Yes or no? Now notice what John sees as this beast, this antichrist beast, is coming to its end. Revelation 13, this first beast is the same power as Daniel chapter 7. They are one and the same. They do the same things. They reign for the same amount of time. They have the same career. The same what word did I say? They're one and the same. Now as John is seeing this beast, this antichrist beast, sort of carry out its mission to destroy and to deceive, he notices that something happens to that beast. And notice with me in verse 10. It says, He who leads into captivity shall what? Go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be what? Killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now what does this mean? Precisely this. This first beast who through the period that we refer to now as the Dark Ages. The what period, everyone? The Dark Ages. Now you might say, well, why was it called the Dark Ages? There are a variety of reasons, but one of the chiefest reasons must be that the Bible says in Psalm 119 and verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And during this period of time, friends, the, the significant part of this period of time, the Bible was removed from the common people. And let me take that a step further. It was illegal to own a Bible. Are you understanding, yes or no? Now remember that Gutenberg didn't invent the printing press until the 15th century, and so for hundreds of years, only the richest, only the most noble could afford to have a hand-scribed uh, copy of the Bible. And friends, it was kept away from the people, usually chained to a church wall or to a monastery wall or to some kind of temple wall, kept away from the common people, in the language of Latin usually, which most of the people could not read, and so people did not have access did not have what word? Access. access to the Bible. Now that's almost impossible for us to grasp, isn't it? I mean, think about it. How many Bibles do you have in your home? I have probably 20 Bibles that I personally own. Friends, this is a great, high, and special privilege. And I remind you of the words of Jesus. To him who much has been given, the more will be required. Amen? We have Bibles, friends. We have study Bibles and women's Bibles and men's Bibles and dad's Bibles and mom's Bibles and African American. Every kind of Bible you can imagine. Yet in those days, Bibles were scarce, but more than scarce, they were illegal to be had. And if you were found with a Bible in your home or even portions or scraps of the Bible, you could be killed. Are you understanding, yes or no? Now what happened was is that when the Bible was taken away from the common people, this then caused the people to have to go to the priest or to the pope or to the prelate or to the cardinal to discover what saith the Lord. The problem is is that much of what was being communicated to them was patently false. Patently what word did I say? False. false. They, they invented all kinds of strange heresies and superstitious idolatries and people didn't have any canon, any Bible to check them out with. And so they believed it and down, down, down humanity went deeper and deeper into superstition because the light of God, the lamp of the word had been taken away. So far so good? Amen. Now, this, peer, this power then was leading individuals who would, who would adhere to the Word as much as they could and adhere to Christ as much as they could, and they shunned the teachings of the church. They said, we accept Christ in Him only. We will not bow the knee to the Pope. We will not bow the knee to the prelate or the, to the cardinal or to the priest. We will stand for the Word and for Jesus Christ, the living Word. But if you said that, friends, you'd be killed. You'd be what word did I say? Killed. killed. 
Now, a very important word that occurs numerous times in Revelation chapter 13, if you were paying attention, was cause. What word is that? Cause. cause. He causes, he causes, he causes. And that's exactly what was taking place during the Dark Ages. People were being forced, they were being compelled, they were being caused. What word? Cause. To worship God in a certain way. Now, when all of this was going on, something like 50 to 100 million, let me say those words again, 50 to 100 million people were killed, martyred, for the heresy of not accepting the teachings of the church over the Bible. Friends, you know what that means? It means that every person in this room would have been martyred in those days. You understanding, yes or no? Friends, it used to mean something to be a Christian. Amen? See, what it means today is, is that you went down to the Christian bookstore and you got yourself one of those little silver fish and you put it on the back of your Honda Accord and now you're a Christian. You with me? But it has not always been so easy. It's not just as easy as getting a little bracelet that says WWJD. Friends, in those days, if you would have held to the beliefs that you hold to now in this room, you would have been exterminated and perhaps your entire family right before your eyes in the name of the church. The Dark Ages, appropriately named, yes or no? Yes. Now, John says, notice this. Remember, we're seeing this in cinematic vision. John says there in verse 10, He that leads into captivity will go into captivity. Notice the next part. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Now follow that very carefully. John is watching the career of this first beast. It is wreaking havoc on God's people, on God's truth. It is just tyrannical and despotic in its career. And John is watching it, watching it, watching it. 1,260 long years, the people of God utterly persecuted. And then he sees it go down. He sees it what? It had been putting people into prison, and now it itself goes into prison. It had been killing with the sword, and now itself goes down with the sword. Now notice this. When did that take place? 1798. When did I say? 1798. We just discussed that when Berthier <laughs> went into, the, went into the, the, the precincts of the Vatican there, took the Bishop of Rome off of his throne, pronounced everything to be public property, and people said, Whoosh, that's the end of the Roman papacy. In 1798, that took place. So get this picture in your mind. John is watching the career of this first beast. Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. 1798, whoosh, down. What's the very next thing that John sees? Verse 11. Then. What's that word? What does the word then mean? It means at that time. Isn't that what it means? The word then is a chronological word. It's a, it's a time word. He sees the beast going down, and the very next word we read is, then. What's then, John? Then I saw what? I saw another beast. So how many beasts are we dealing with now? Two beasts. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Is that different, yes or no? Significantly different. We'll come back to that. And he had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a Verse 11 is one of the strangest verses in all the Bible. It is the only verse that I personally know of that contains the word lamb and dragon in the same versification. Now let me try to unpack the significance of that for you. Who is the lamb in Scripture, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? Behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Who is that? Jesus. Now who's the dragon? Now isn't that remarkable? Right here in one verse, both the lamb and Satan occur. Jesus and Satan. And notice that this beast is described as having the twin characteristics of both of these powers. Now that seems almost impossible, doesn't it? I said, doesn't it? I mean, think about the significance. He says, I saw this beast coming up, two horns like a, what everyone? Lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. So there's a paradox here. A what word? How can he be rising like a lamb, having horns like a lamb, and yet speaking like the devil himself. Notice the Bible goes on to describe him, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes. What's that word? Causes the, how many people? The earth and those who dwell in it to worship. Quick question. Can you cause somebody to worship in spirit and in truth? The answer is no. 
That's, an, that's a salient point that we must note here. It is impossible to cause somebody to worship. Jesus, for example, says in Matthew chapter 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He woos, he invites, he gives the invitation, but Jesus never, friends, gets you in the headlock, twist the arm, knee in the back, now worship me. It just doesn't happen, does it? That's not our God, amen? amen? He's a gentlemanly God. Yet remarkably, this second beast is described as causing the earth to, what's that word? Worship. worship. What a strange juxtaposition. How can you cause to worship? Notice as it goes on here, He causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that He even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. We've talked about some of those signs, and signs will be used rampantly and prolifically in the last days to deceive. Verse 14, And He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those, what? Miracles or signs which He was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and live. Notice the emphasis is back on the first beast. Here it comes again in verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause. cause as many as who would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Verse 16, he causes. You see that? Three times. So then if I ask you in one sentence, what does the second beast do? You could say it just like this. He causes the earth to worship the first beast. Amen. Are you comfortable with that? Yes or no? Yes. That's exactly what John is communicating. The first beast comes up, reigns for 1,260 years, goes down. Another beast comes up. He appears to be lamb-like, Christ-like, but he speaks like a dragon, and he causes the people, the whole earth, to worship the first beast. You understand Revelation chapter 13. Now it's just a matter of plugging in the pieces. Now before we go one moment further, let me just ask you a question here. Do you feel like you understand the overview of the chapter, yes or no? Raise your hands high to heaven. Okay, good. It's not difficult to grasp, is it? Much in Revelation is not difficult to grasp. No, don't give me that, brother. If, if I do that, I'll be in trouble. I'll start wiping it all over me, and I'll have Kleenex stuck to my face, and we'll be... Okay, here we go. So, the second beast causes the earth to worship the first beast. That's the whole point. Who then is this earth beast? Let's put it all together. Let's note several facts from the biblical record. Number one, where does this beast arise? You tell me. Where does it rise? Out of the earth. Now, you say, what's the significance of that? It's very easy, actually. Now, seas is where the first beast rose. And seas, or water, represents peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Namely, a populated area. Amen? Now, this beast rises up, not out of the sea, but out of the earth. Now, if sea represents a populated area, by, by logical inference, and even if we had time, we could go to Revelation chapter 12 and demonstrate it biblically, what happens there, friends, is that Land then represents the antithesis or the opposite of that, namely a sparsely populated area. You with me? Yes or no? So sea, populated area, and land, a, a relatively unpopulated area. Now, when does this beast arise? We've already nailed that one right on the head. It arises sometime around 1798. Are you comfortable with that? Yes or no? Amen. Now, why do I say that? Because John saw the, remember, sort of in, cinemat in cinematic uh, chronology there, he sees one beast, one beast, one beast goes down, and then he sees another beast coming up. Comfortable? Yes or no? Yeah. So sometime around 1798. Number three, how does this beast arise? Does this beast have the predatorial um, characteristics of the other beasts? The other beasts are described as lions and bears and leopards and ferocious beasts with iron teeth. This beast doesn't sound anything like that, friends. The only thing we have here is a lamb. A what, everyone? Lamb. A lamb. And notice what it says there in verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Now, I wish I had time to go into the etymology of this word here. But, but the Greek word here is the same word that is used to describe a plant when it is just beginning to grow. And how does a plant grow? Violently? How does a plant grow? Silently. Almost unobserved. You know, you, you come out one day and, and uh, if you've planted your garden, there are no plants. You come out the next day and there's just these little things. And you come out a week later and they're just a little bigger and a little bigger. If you sat there and watched a plant, you couldn't tell it was growing, but over time it grows silently, almost imperceptibly. You with me? Yes or no? So this beast wouldn't be conquering another power and displacing them and disquieting them. It would be silently, quietly, almost imperceptibly coming to the forefront. 
Okay? So then, where does it arise? Out of the earth, a relatively unpopulated area. So we can't look for it in the old world of Europe where all the other beasts were coming up because that was the sea. When does it arise? Around 1798. And how does it arise? Quietly, almost imperceptibly. Are we all together so far? Yes or no? You're putting the pieces together. Who then is the second beast? Well, let us notice a couple other points. Note with me that there are no crowns on the horns of the second beast. There are no, what word did I say? Crowns. crowns. Now, did the first beast have crowns? Yes. yes. And we've already learned that horn in this context represents power and strength. And what does a crown represent? King, that's right, nobility and royalty. And if you put a crown on a horn, you have kingly authority, a claim to kingly authority. Now, remarkably, this beast that comes up like a lamb does not have a crown. Now, that almost stands to reason. Let's walk through something here very quickly. The word lamb occurs less than 30 times in the New Testament, something like 29 times. 26 of those times, I believe, are in the book of Revelation. 26 times lamb in Revelation, and it refers to, guess what? Jesus in every single instance except one. And you just read it. The only instance, the only usage of the word lamb that does not refer to Jesus is the one you just read. It refers to this lamb-like beast. Now, if it's a lamb-like beast, what do you think John is trying to communicate? That it's a beast like Jesus. In other words, it would espouse Christian principles. Now, did Jesus ever cause people to worship him? No, 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 no. Jesus said things like this in Luke chapter 4, beginning around verse 16. He said, I am come to set at liberty the captives. Set at what? Liberty. liberty. John chapter 8, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free, free indeed. Matthew 11, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. John chapter 12, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will drive all people to me. What is it? I will draw all people to me. So Jesus woos, he invites, he gives the invitation to come and to worship him, but this beast causes and forces. This beast would espouse Christian-like principles. It's lamb-like. There are no horns, no crowns rather on those horns, symbolizing not an oligarchy, not a monarchy, but a different kind of beast altogether. No kings here. Now, Remember that that second beast did have crowns, or the first beast did have crowns. And we've already discovered that those crowns indicate kingly authority. So there would be no claim to kingly authority with this first or second beast, rather. Okay? Amen? Amen. We're all on the same page. Well, who then is the earth beast? If we put all the pieces together, it is not difficult to surmise who this beast is. Let's go through them quickly, and then we'll identify this second beast. Who is this beast? Well, he arises around 1798 in a relatively unpopulated area, a young nation, because it was rising like a plant, coming up freshly, silently, imperceptibly, without a king, without a what? And it would eventually attain what kind of power? Now, how do I know that it would attain world power? That's exactly right, Pastor Jason. Let's go look at it, Revelation chapter 13 again. Revelation chapter 13, there are numerous passages, but notice with me just verse 12. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes South Dakota. Causes Michigan. Causes what, everyone? The earth. the earth. Now, only a worldwide power could cause the earth to do anything. Amen? I mean, let's pick on my good friend Andre Diaz is here tonight, so I'm going to pick on him. Andre's from the Dominican Republic. Now, I, I have been in the Caribbean, and it's beautiful, and I'm sure the Dominican people are great people, and I don't even know who the governor is, so I might get myself into big trouble, but I'm going to try it here. Can you imagine if whoever the ambassador or the leader or the prime minister, whoever is of the Dominican Republic, made a decree that all the world had to start eating rice and beans? They made this decree. It's an official decree. The, the world must start eating rice and beans. Would you start? You know what you'd say? Where's the Dominican Republic? <laughs> You understand? Friends, we are not dealing with just some small country here that has limited influence. It might be a beautiful country, a wonderful country, and it is no doubt. But we are not dealing with some small country that has limited power, limited authority, and limited influence. Amen? Amen. This must be a worldwide power that can cause the earth. You with me, yes or no? Yes. So we affirm then, number one, it arises around 1798, number two, in a relatively unpopulated area, number three, a young nation, number four, without a king, that would eventually attain to world power. Now, friends, who is this? 
Who could this possibly be? You don't have to be a Jason Sieber. You don't have to be a historical polymath to know the answer to this one, friends. Who is this? Who could this beast be? Hmm, friends, it is exactly as you have described. It is, in fact, the United States of America. Does the United States of America meet these qualifiers? Does it fit into each of these qualifiers? The answer is yes. Consider with me here. The first constitutional convention, Jason, check my dates here, May 25th, 1787. Is that around 1798, yes or no? Remember, John saw one going down, and as one was on its way down, the other was on its way up. Notice also the Declaration of Independence signed July 4th, 1776. So does the time element qualify, yes or no? How about the place that it arises? Does it, does it arise in a relatively unpopulated area, yes or no? You're hitting the nail on the head. How about a king in this country? No, 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 no kings in this country. And if, if George Bush or any other president began to put a crown on his head, there'd be riots in the streets. You with me, yes or no? Now, how about the way that this nation grew? Did it grow by conquering and overtaking and displacing other nations? Not so much. Now, let me just give a word here. And the reason I give this word is that I actually have a significant amount of Native American in me. My father was Native American. We were very unkind and very ungracious as a nation to the indigenous peoples of this land. Amen. And we don't want to discount that. But it is true, though, that this nation was not conquered so much as it was discovered. You with me, yes or no? So does it fit? Yes. Now, has this nation attained to worldwide prominence and power? The answer to that is an unequivocal, resounding yes. And think about this for just a moment. Friends, the United States of America has only been around about 200 years. Other nations that exist today have been around for thousands of years. Think about nations like Egypt and Greece. These nations have been around forever, basically. Are you with me? Yet this country has reigned for just 200 short years, and there is no question, friends, that right now we are the preeminent, potent hyperpower of the entire world. What we say goes. Are you with me? Think just, for example, about this most recent war in Iraq. We said, hey, we're going to go over to Iraq, and we're going to start a war. And, and the United Nations says no. And we said, so. Are you with me now? What we say goes. The whole world wants to be on our side because of our military power, our economic power, our governmental power. Whatever, uh, you know, uh, my wife's from Romania, you know that. And I was in Romania and I was preaching this message and a friend came up to me and he said, you know, we have a saying in Romania and that saying is that when the United States sneezes, the world gets a cold. <laughs> you follow me? Whatever, we set, we're setting the trends and what we say goes. Friends, we are not just a superpower. We are the superpower. Now, I'm not saying that that's a great thing or a bad thing. All I'm saying is that's a real thing. You with me? So does it meet all of the identifying qualifiers, yes or no? Every one of them, shh, locked up. Now, what about this thing about being lamb-like? Does this nation espouse lamb-like Christian principles, yes or no? Absolutely, friends. And let us notice a few of those here on the screen. I quote to you now from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created, what's the next word? Equal. Equal, that they are endowed by their Creator. Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are, say it with me, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you believe that? Yes. That's what this nation is founded upon in part, friends. It's a beautiful document. I believe that the Spirit of God helped those men to write up that document. Not that it's an inspired document, but that it is a powerful document. Why? Because it upholds the great Judeo-Christian values of honoring others in their pursuits and not causing. What word did I say? Oh. Or forcing or compelling. Notice this one here from the First Amendment of the Constitution. It says, Congress shall make how many laws? No law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And in our com common vernacular, our common colloquial saying, we call this the separation of, say it with me, church and state. Right? Now, why would they be so, so solid and so strong on the separation of church and state? Precisely, friends, because they came from the old world. From the what two words did I say? Old. Old, and in the old world, the church and the state were bed partners. And when the church and the state got together, they saw that it was a sour mixture for those who were not in harmony with the state-levied religion. You with me now? Yes or no? 
And that's what took place during the Dark Ages when that first beast, the Roman church state, basically said to all of the governing powers, you enforce our doctrines, you enforce our dogmas, you enforce our decrees, or else we'll excommunicate you. Now remember those days, even the kings and queens, many of them didn't have access to the Bible. And when the bishop of Rome said, you'll be excommunicated, these men trembled in fear before a nation that didn't even have an army. Are you understanding? Yeah. And so they basically became the henchmen carrying out the wills and wiles and, and, and devices of the first beast, the Roman church state. You with me? Yeah. And we're moving rapidly. When they came to this country, though, our forefathers and foremother, foremothers said, no, 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 no. We're going to put church over here, and we're going to put state over here, and they will be separate. Amen. Friends, in this country, you have the greatest right in the world, the right to be wrong. Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen? If somebody wanted to start a religion and they were going to worship that pulpit, could they do it? Absolutely. And friends, we would say that's idiotic, that's ridiculous, that is banal in the extreme, but we would say in this country, you have a right to do it. Amen? Amen. I think it was George Thorogood Marshall who said, your rights end where my nose begins. Amen? Amen? You can do what you want to do as long as it doesn't infringe upon my rights. Okay? So notice this then. We go to the screen again. There are two great things, two great liberties that make America strong. The secret of America's strength. Number one is civil liberty. Freedom from a king. Number two is religious liberty. Freedom from a pope. A religious leader that insists on the way that he must be worshipped. Civil liberty and religious liberty. Can you say amen? amen? And friends, never the twain shall meet. Amen. Church here and state here. Okay? Now, let's continue. Notice these two quotations very quickly. The first is taken from George Washington. Ever heard of him? Yeah. Now, even, even you and I know who George Washington was, right? Yeah. Who was he? First, first president of the United States of America. That's right. Where was he born, by the way, Jason? Virginia. Virginia. <laughs> what year was he born? Oh, I put him on the spot. Every man conducting himself as a good citizen and being accountable to God. God. What's the next word? alone for his religious opinions ought to be protected in worshiping the de deity according to the dictates of his own good conscience. You see what he's saying? Don't tell me how to worship. I will work that out between my creator and myself. Amen? Amen? Amen. State has nothing to say about it. What can the state say about it? Notice this one from Benjamin Franklin. When religion is good, I love this quote. It's very clever, just like Franklin. When religion is good, it will take care of itself. Amen? When it is not able to take care of itself and God does not see fit to take care of it so that it has to appeal to the civil power for support, it's evidence to my mind that the cause is a bad one. Yeah. You see what he's saying? You keep the two separate. And the state doesn't fund religion and the state doesn't endorse any particular state-levied religion. Amen? Yeah. Powerful. Now that's what the Bible says when it says that he would, he would have lamb-like horns. He would espouse these Christian principles. But what does the rest of that verse say? Notice with me there in verse 11. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like... What did he speak like? A dragon. Now, who's the dragon? The dragon is Satan. Now, remember, before we go to our next slide, you, you all can see it, but the, viewing, the television audience cannot yet see it. Remember, what is the purpose of the second beast in Revelation chapter 13? You tell me. Come on. To point to the... First beast and to, what's the word? What's the cause? You've got it. To cause the earth to worship the first beast. So then, if we have correctly identified these two, and I believe we have, friends, based on the Bible, not on what some man says, but on what the Bible says. Amen. If we have correctly identified the first beast as the Roman church state, and the second beast as the United States of America, then let's just fill in the blanks. If the first beast, or the second beast, will cause the earth to worship the first beast, then it's just elementary. We just fill in the antecedents to these pronouns. That would mean, then, that the United States would begin formulating alliances in which it would be causing, urging, and moving the world to worship, honor, and give obeisance to the Roman church state. Amen. You with me now? Amen. Now, you say, no way. Impossible. Cannot happen in this country. Separation of church and state. No, no, no. Congress shall make no law respecting relig religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Can't happen here. You must have your interpretation wrong, Pastor Asterisk. Remember this, friends. The Bible is the arbiter of reality and history. History and reality are not the arbiters of the Bible. Amen. If the Bible says it, I believe it. 
and that settles it. Amen. You understand? Yes. Friends, Eve was standing at the tree, and if she would have stood on a plain, thus saith the Lord, she would have been safe, but she saw that the tree was good and that it was nice, a tree to be desired to make one wise. And instead of standing on what God had said, she stood on what her eyes, her emotions, and her senses told her, and she fell. Friends, listen very carefully. You might think, no, 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 this could never happen in the United States causing the earth to give obeisance and, and honor to the first beast, the Roman church state, but friends, it's already happening. Amen. Notice this incredible here. This is taken from the February... Uh, first, 1992 issue of Time Magazine, right here on the cover. Holy Alliance, how Reagan and the Pope conspired. What word is that? Conspired, conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. Now, who is involved in this, this Holy Alliance? Who are the two powers? The capital, the capitalist West, the United States, and the Roman Church State. Notice it says they conspire. That is to say they got together to enforce their will on another sovereign nation, namely in this instance, Poland. And friends, what happened in the, in the wake of this is that Johannes Paulus II, who we refer to as the Bishop of Rome or the Pope, was, was named the man of the year because of the role that he played in, in bringing down, quote-unquote, communism. But really what had happened, friends, is that you had the big three C's. You had Catholicism, capitalism, and communism. And two of the C's, communism, or pardon me, capitalism and Catholicism, that is the United States and the church, got together to bring down the other C. So you used to have three C's, and now you have two C's. You with me now? Amen. By the way, that is totally documentable, and that's actually what this whole naming him as Time Man of the Year was all about. He had brought down communism, not single-handedly, but with the aid of a nation who was working together, silently, secretly. Now, friends, the only way that this is going to happen, the only way that the Roman church state is going to be able to receive the obeisance and honor of peoples not just the world over, but right here in the United States, is if you have a coming together of the churches. A coming together of the what? Churches. churches. That is to say both the Catholic churches and the evangelical churches. You say, well, fortunately, that's not happening. Well, it is happening, friends. Notice this incredible book here on the screen. Evangelicals and Catholics Together. This was a 1994 book written by two men, one a Roman Catholic and one a uh, Protestant, Charles Colson and Richard John Newhouse, towards a common mission. A what kind of mission? See, what's happening, friends, is many churches now are uniting on political grounds. What kind of grounds? Because they oppose and uphold many of the same things. For example, they oppose abortion, and they uphold school vouchers, and they oppose certain issues, pornography and others, and, and they're, they're saying, hey, you know, you're not so far off after all. After all, we believe roughly the same things, and, and if we unite together, we can be a stronger, listen to my words carefully, a stronger political force. A stronger what kind of a force? So are we seeing a coming together in, in, in Catholic evangelical relations, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. History has never seen a more ecumenical pope than the one we have right now, Johannes Paulus II, opening his arms and bringing all in. Now listen, I'm all for unity. Amen? Amen. Unity is great as long as we are unified on a plane, thus saith the Lord. And not some artificial unity on what a man says or what a church says, but on what the Word says. Amen. All right, so let us continue here. Notice this incredible. This is taken from the November 1, 1999 front page of the Washington Post. November 1, 1990 what? Five years ago. Lutherans and Catholics unite to heal. Notice that language, to heal. 482-year-old division. What does the Bible say in Revelation 13, 3? His deadly wound was healed. Are you with me? Amen. Friends, that, you know the Washington Post, right? Is that a religious journal? No. That's one of the preeminent secular journals and newspapers of the nation, friends. And notice the language that's being used here. Lutherans and Catholics unite. And basically what they decided was is that the whole Protestant Reformation was, oops, a mistake. And friends, if Martin Luther was alive, or if he, even if he wasn't alive, he is rolling in his grave. The Bible predicts an erosion of our freedoms when church and state unite right here in the what? United States. Right here in our beloved United States. Friends, we have a decision to make. And the same decision that we will have to make is the decision that the people outside of the Roman Praetorium had to make, and that is this decision. We will choose between Jesus Christ or Rome. And what did the people in those days say? They cried out, we have no king but Caesar. Caesar. 
Now, I want you to know that what I have said tonight is very provocative and profound, and it's either wrong or it's right. Now, I happen to believe on the authority of the Word that it's right. Amen. And this is what I'm saying, friends, and make no mistake about it. I don't want to equivocate here at the end. The United States is already formulating unholy alliances with the papacy. Those alliances will only increase and grow stronger and still stronger and still stronger until eventually the United States will pass worldwide laws. What kinds of laws? Worldwide laws. Do you think we have the power and the efficacy to do that? It's happening right now. Causing the earth to worship the Roman church state. Friends, that's what the Bible says. All of this will come to a head in the mark of the beast crisis. The what crisis? The mark of the beast. You're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's the mark of the beast? You have to come back tomorrow night. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Two questions tonight as we close. Number one, has this message been clear, yes or no? Yes. Good. Second question then, how many of you want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ rather than the Antichrist? Oh, raise your hands high, friends. Amen. I'm raising my hand with you. Praise Jesus.